states where they have switched to a conviction only situation, what happens to the property when it may take two years before there is a conviction in the case? It seems to me like having a more expedited civil system, where by the way, the state does have the burden initially to show that this by prob probable cause, the same standard as getting an indictment in a criminal case. That the property, that a crime was committed and that the property was connected to that crime. Um, so I'm curious how these other states process it because the real reality is most of these default cases are because either no one is claiming the property or because they're guilty and they don't want to come and say, yeah, that's mine because then that will make the criminal case easier. So that's the reason for most default judgments in these cases. It's not that people are being railroaded. It's that oftentimes nobody comes to claim it, but we have instituted, and we should institute, due process to make sure the government isn't just picking up abandoned property and keeping it. Do you support any reform? Our association does not will not come out with anything like that. You'd have to talk to individual prosecutors to decide what they would or won't support. I'm not entirely confident that most civil forfeitures are the result of no of an abandonment or of uh, someone being afraid because they think that they'll be indicted. So another type of abandonment. So I'm not sure that it's all abandonment. And that's something that folks can take a look at and ask local law enforcement for, for members if they have any numbers on these sorts of things. <laughs> It's also a reason that we should have better reporting on what's going on so we can verify the claims that I'm making and the claims that Shannon's making um, and actually understand how forfeiture is working at a granular level in this state. This, this is to Mr. Edmonds. You, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a popular man. You spoke about the legislative process and I understood you to say that every session since 1989 has in some way changed the statute and that every time it's expanded the forfeiture scope and which would say that well everybody's happy with this I guess but you also mentioned that well if there are abuses Senator Whitmire's done some great work with it uh, could you speak to that sort of uh, there seems to be a tension between those statements. Could you speak to what you said about the legislative process more? Uh, yes, I can. Um, you know, at the legislature, oftentimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And many of the changes to the statute have been relatively minor. You know, just adding some random finance code offense to the list of offenses for which uh, forfeiture may apply. Because remember, it doesn't apply to all crimes. There's a list of offenses which can trigger asset forfeiture, but it's not even most crimes, it's just mostly certain felonies. What we have seen in reforms have been in response to specific horror stories that you've seen in the paper. So we have a statute now that basically says you can't spend forfeiture money for margarita machines. You can't spend asset forfeiture money on your own political campaign. You can't donate um, asset forfeiture funds to a charity or an entity unrelated to criminal justice. And each one of those came out of headlines or news stories where there was some abuse. Right? In the Tenaha case, which was how long that was? Is that six years ago? Yes, yeah, so that's six years ago, right? Margarine Machine, ten years ago. Tenaha, six years ago. Um, we instituted some reforms that said officers can no longer do what Representative Simpson mentioned, which is at the side of the road, try to convince uh, <coughs> drivers or citizens that they should just waive their interest in that money. And a related issue is they said that you can't bring them into the police station and try to get them to sign a waiver. The state can't do anything for 30 days. You have to file that action and give the person notice so that they have time to decide what to do, whether or not they want to claim it, if it really is theirs, and not be subjected to that type of uh, improper pressure. And so. We've made reforms in 2009, 2011, last session. We instituted a list of things that you can spend it on, just to be clear. Because one, you know, law enforcement and prosecutors, they know that misspending money is one of the things that gets you unelected. Okay? So they're often over-cautious 
and how they spend it. So they're frequently asking the Attorney General or asking our office how they can spend it. So we handily put a list of things that law enforcement and prosecutors know that they can spend the money on. You know, like, uh, you know, bulletproof vests or uh, training or things like that that I think everybody agrees is a legitimate use of that funds and which by being used avoids the need to have to use tax dollars for more citizens. I'm going to add a quick, I'm going to make a quick follow-up question. You mentioned about the police stopping you and not being able to coerce the money out of you. But I, I heard the comment about the police asking, oh, do you have any cash? I just stopped you for 35 and a 30 zone. And the, the comment was made, I believe Mr. Poster said this, you must answer truthfully. But he didn't say, must you answer? Are you required to answer that question? Uh, I don't know if that wasn't me, but I heard the answer would be no. Yeah, I don't know if anything would require you to answer that question. You, you, you can just not answer. Okay, thank you. Sir. The discussion in the last one minute may have obviated most of what I was going to ask, but it's going to remind everyone the subject was civil uh, forfeiture, not criminal. And Mr. Miller and Mr. Coster both gave good examples where there was no conviction, there was no criminal, there were no fruits of the crime, and Mr. Edmonds, you kept talking about with your fence example in 89, it was the height of the crime rate. Nobody's talking about a crime in some of Mr. Miller's examples. Representative, you gave an excellent talk, mostly based on crime. There was discussion of probable cause, all those other criminal things. But I think if you look at some of Mr. Miller's examples, such as the one we just talked about, literally in a one minute, and I was already in line, of a policeman asking you how much money you have in your pocket. And Mr. Edmonds, I don't think for a minute, but feel free to correct me, that if you leave here today, and head back to the office, and a policeman stops you because your brake light is burned out, and asks you if you have any money in your pocket, and then says, why don't you come down to headquarters and sign a waiver? I don't think for a minute you'd be anything but outraged. And I don't know any neighbors or friends who think that is far over the line. So I would recommend to the representatives in the room, if you take this up in the coming legislature, be sure everybody's hearing the difference between civil and criminal. Be sure everybody's hearing the everyday examples that Mr. Miller gave and don't wad it up into this big ball of forfeiture because a very large amount of it, we would all agree with what the representative said. Whereas some of the examples Mr. Miller said, I think most citizens would think that's an outrage. Thank you. I'd just like to say that since to many citizens, when an official and one especially with a badge and carrying a gun ask questions. They're not thinking of uh, whether this is constitutional or not, um, whether it's oppression or not, whether it's an appropriate question uh, to be asking someone for simply being pulled over for not being in the right lane. And uh, I do think we need to be concerned with it and they're basically, we need good people doing those things, and most of the time we do, but we do have some problems in those instances. And even with civil asset forfeiture, they, we may call it civil, but the fact is, we're claiming that it's connected to a crime. So we're, we're kind of speaking out of both sides of our mouth, and we're real good at that here at the legislature. <laughs> uh, and sometimes it's not the, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Sometimes we want you to think that we don't know what the left hand is doing. And so we call it by a different name. They're very much connected with crime or why, as a police officer, seeking the forfeiture of the property. One thing we haven't 
really mention too much is what happens if there were no civil forfeiture. And I think, you know, especially if there is not going to be an, an indictment or, uh, you know, but, but there's the car, there's the drug, alleged drug money there, or there's a car, or you think the money's going to be, um, they're going to, you know, ship it to the Cayman Islands, or they're going to go on the land or something like that. And the reality is, 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 is under the criminal code in most states, and I would imagine it's the same thing here in Texas, you can still seize temporarily. You can go to a judge and say, look, or you can seize it on site, and you can go to a judge to get it baptized and say, we want to hang on to this pending charges or trial, and then there's some process to automatically give it back um, if there ends up not being any sort of conviction. So it's not like the sky falls in the absence of conviction. Yeah, and to the extent that we needed to harmonize you know, the reforms so that you would still have time to seize assets and forfeit assets in criminal cases, that can be done through maybe any reform measure. Just, just add one thing. Most of these laws that I know that deal with contraband and forfeiture, and I may be wrong because I just really studied this, they're all under the Code of Criminal Procedure. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's difficult to sort it out from civil and criminal. Thank you. We have time for one more question, I'm being told. Uh, seems to me a big issue that uh, Mr. Miller brought up was the fact that a lot of these cases are small dollar cases. You're talking about like eight hundred thousand dollars, fifteen hundred. I don't know of any lawyer who's gonna, you know, spend their time to try to uh, represent somebody when there's that little amount of money available, and no one's gonna hire a lawyer uh, in order to try to defend that amount of money. So I'm just wondering uh, what the panel might say to a possible reform where attorney fees might be awarded uh, to a property owner who ends up winning their asset forfeiture and those funds being taken out of the police and prosecutor's funds uh, if they do win. It sounds like a good idea um, because you have to have some way for people to defend themselves. And that means either you provide them with something like a public defender or you incentivize lawyers to come and defend them. And I'm not sure how you do it without awarding attorney's fees. Um, it's something I haven't looked at specifically, so I need to know kind of how the state law currently works to have a more intelligent answer to you. But I do agree that something has to be done because you have person after person who just can't afford um, to defend themselves. They want to be a couple quick, quick points on that. Number one, public defenders are usually, they are certainly are at a better level prohibited from defending folks in court interaction because they're just, they are underfunded. And spend your time getting a guy off on the conviction, don't spend your time going after the property. Number one, they're prohibited. States can possibly look at that, but that's expensive. Number two, there is a back end, there are always back end tort solutions. I think that in Michigan, for example, in cases of Florida, uh, where you know, if police do something that's so egregious in a seizure, so contrary to law, you know, they can be on the hook for those types of funding as well. I'm a bit reticent to, 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 to do that kind of English rule fee shifting because there are law enforcement incentives that go both ways and it's important to, I mean, there are enough problems with fixing the procedure uh, without trying to, you know, hammer law enforcement too hard. I think in DC what they did was they said, you know, um, cash under 300, we're not going to, presuming we can't seize that, cars you can't seize if it's the only car that's going to be born, the home if it's their primary residence is not seized. So again, I think the last point we made, point four about, about a, a sharing floor is I think can handle a lot of this. Anyone else? Okay, well everybody, I'd like to thank you all for coming out for our discussion today. We look forward to uh, following the issue as it moves through the 84th legislature. And if you have any questions, again, feel free, our, um, feel free to go to texaspolicy.com where you can find the Civil Asset Corporate Report or to IJ or Heritage as well. Thank you very much. Yeah.